This is David Harvey, and you're listening to the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a podcast that looks at capitalism through a Marxist lens. This podcast is made possible by Democracy at Work. I recall a seminar some time ago I was uh, involved in with uh, my good friend uh, Giovanni Arrighi, and we were talking about some of the processes that were going on around the world, uh, because uh, Giovanni was very much concerned with uh, how to understand the global structures of uh, capital accumulation. And at some point or other, I recall saying, look, uh, we're not only dealing with an accumulation of capital, which is based on the exploitation of uh, living labor in production, uh, in the way that Marx describes in, in volume one and capital in great detail, but we're also dealing with uh, practices of accumulation which are really based upon dispossession. And Giovanni looked at me and he said, oh, you mean to say we have to think about accumulation by dispossession? And I said, yeah, I think we have to look at that. And since then I have been writing about accumulation by dispossession because I think that this is uh, something which uh, parallels the exploitation of living labor in production as a way in which capital works. Now, when I talk about accumulation by dispossession, I'm really talking not so much about primitive accumulation, which forces people off the land, encloses the commons, uh, leads to the creation of a wage labor force. What I'm talking about is the fact that accumulated wealth in some form or other is being appropriated and, and uh, by uh, certain sectors of capital. And there are a number of ways in which this is going on. And I would want to make the argument that the form of contemporary capitalism uh, is heavily inflected towards accumulation by dispossession as opposed to accumulation through exploitation of living labor in production. Now, what do I mean by this? Uh, for example, uh, Marx himself actually talks at a certain point in Capital about the way in which capital centralizes. Now, the centralization of capital means that capital uh, steals uh, uh, from small producers the assets that they have. Uh, and one of the big forms of, uh, of activity in our own society is mergers and acquisitions in the market, in which big capital takes over small, small fish, as it were, gobbles them up and starts to expand uh, its power uh, and, and its mass uh, simply by takeovers of more and more uh, small capital. And Marx talks about all of this uh, as being uh, what he calls the laws of centralization of capital, in which increasingly within particular sectors, uh, large capital takes over smaller capital till in the end you get a quasi-monopolistic situation of the large capitalist dominating all else. So if you look at something like the rise of Google, for example, uh, how many small uh, operations did Google take over in its expansion to the point where it now is, of course, this major corporation? Uh, and in fact, uh, you know, this is the way in which Silicon Valley works. People work on you know, developing small kind of apps and this kind of thing. At some point or other, they're bought out uh, by the big capital and they become part of this vast conglomerate. So that individual capitalists can therefore accumulate, not, not by employing labor, but by simply taking over uh, the assets of others. And we then see certain situations arising in which, as Marx says, the credit system becomes one of the major vehicles of centralization of capital. And it works uh, in, this, in this kind of way. That if you cut the flow of liquidity to some sector of the economy, then uh, there is a great difficulty in that sector of the economy of firms actually refinancing uh, their debt. And if they can't refinance their debt, then essentially they get forced into bankruptcy. Now, this is what happened in East and Southeast Asia in 1997-98. For some time, the liquidity was constrained and good firms couldn't refinance and they were forced into bankruptcy. And so you get a crisis in the economies of East and Southeast Asia of good companies basically going into bankruptcy. Now, what then happens is that big capital from outside steps in, buys up these firms which are filing for bankruptcy, uh, which are perfectly viable firms, it's just that they can't get the finance to, to continue, 
uh, the outsiders buy up the companies. Uh, and uh, then what they do is essentially acquire all of the assets, hold the assets for a while, and when the flow of liquidity is re resumes, the economy recovers, and then you can sell back uh, these uh, assets uh, at, a, at a great profit. We see something similar happening, uh, not only in, in East and Southeast Asia, but we saw something like that going on during the housing crisis here in the United States. For example, a lot of people found themselves forced, in some instances illegally, it turns out, uh, to surrender uh, the asset value of their home. Um, so we have foreclosures. They couldn't pay, uh, they couldn't pay their, 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 uh, their mortgage. And so you get a vast number of houses which are being sold uh, at uh, sort of uh, foreclosed prices. So in steps a private equity company like uh, Blackstone's and it starts to buy up all of these houses again at fire sale prices, foreclosed houses. And so Blackstone is now, I think, uh, the largest landlord in the country. It has thousands and thousands of, uh, of, 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 of houses which is bought up. Uh, what it then does is to turn them round and, and, and rent them out at, at, at some sort of uh, profit. Uh, and as the housing market recovers, and depending upon which market you're in, if you're in San Francisco or New York, it recovered fairly fast. In other places it didn't. As the housing market recovers, then you can sell them back at, at a vast profit. This is what this, what this says is that actually... Uh, large segments of the economy are being run on the accumulation of capital which is not involved in producing anything. It's all about uh, the trading of asset values, but trading of asset values under conditions in which the asset values are forced uh, to be devalued at a certain historical moment by, me by mechanisms in the market and then uh, revalued uh, and as they're revalued, so uh, the, the private equity companies can capitalize upon the revaluation. So this is, if you like, a, a, a mode of accumulation which has absolutely nothing to do with production. But when you look at it very carefully, you see that actually a lot of uh, wealth in society is being uh, developed in this way. But it, it also means that uh, certain kinds of uh, increase in value are occurring and that accumulation of capital is occurring through these processes as asset values are revalued upwards. So that accumulation is no longer, as I've said, a result of production. It's uh, a, a, a result of trading upon asset values. Now, there are other ways in which we will see this, uh, this process occurring. Uh, for example, uh, if there is a part of town which is beginning to look like it's, uh, you know, uh, going to go up in quality, uh, we get uh, the kind of the famous gentrification uh, process in which uh, you need to expel certain populations from, uh, from the, the, the space. Now, how, how is that done? Uh, well, there are a number of ways it can be done, some of it legal, some of it illegal. Uh, one, and, and landlords, of course, have wonderful ways to, to try to get tenants out of their, their buildings. They, uh, you know, there are all kinds of uh, strategies for doing that. Uh, of course, in the 1970s, there was this strategy of burning down buildings, and the Bronx was burning, as, a, as, as it was said at the time. So the, uh, these, these processes of, uh, of, of eviction uh, are actually becoming very, very significant in, in uh, urban areas throughout uh, the, the capitalist world. And as you, as you evict populations, so uh, at a certain point, uh, the, the evicted populations have to go live somewhere. So this is a, a little bit like what Marx talked about in primitive accumulation on the land, except this is not happening uh, to create wage labor. This is, this is, create, this is going on uh, to try to liberate spaces so that capital can come in and rebuild uh, in a certain area, re-gentrify, if you like, through, through a strategy of, uh, of accumulation uh, through, through urbanization.
So when we look at something like this, again, it's accumulation by dispossession. People are dispossessed of their rights, of their access to uh, key air, good areas for the city to live in. They're forced out. They're forced out to live on the margins uh, where, where maybe they have long commutes to get to work and, uh, and that. And so again and again and again, uh, we will look, we'll see a kind of a sort of history of eviction, of an expulsions going on. We will see uh, similar things going on back again upon the land. There is a process of what we call land grabbing. Uh, which is going on all over Africa and throughout Latin America as well, in which uh, capital looking for uh, good places to invest will say, look, the future lies upon control over land and the assets on the land, like raw materials and, uh, and, and mineral resources and, uh, and productive capacity of the land. And so uh, big capital starts to move in and to speculate in land values and speculating on land values, you find that land values start to be forced upwards and upwards and upwards uh, to the point where actually uh, value is now uh, uh, accumulating in the hands of the rentiers rather than in the hands of the direct uh, producers. There is another way in which uh, we start to see accumulation by dispossession occurring. Uh, people employed uh, uh, frequently uh, by a company will have, of course, uh, uh, on behalf of that company, will have uh, health care uh, rights, uh, often in their contracts. Uh, they will have uh, pension rights, uh, and uh, pension rights become a terribly important uh, uh, feature of uh, contemporary society, particularly in the advanced capitalist world. But we're now seeing some of these issues being uh, being raised even in countries like uh, like China. So uh, pension rights are a, a, a form of future income which is supposedly guaranteed based upon certain contributions which people have made to to their pension funds. But many corporations find themselves in a situation where the obligations of the pension funds and the health care are far, far too much uh, to, uh, to be really continually funded over time. So what we've seen are major corporations, and actually the airlines have been good at this. Uh, United Airlines declare, declares bankruptcy. Uh, American Airlines declares bankruptcy. Now, that doesn't mean they stop flying. They go into sort of Chapter 11 or what it is, and they have to renegotiate all of their obligations. And they go to a judge, and they basically say, look, uh, we need uh, to resume our operations, and we can do so in, on a clean, lean basis, provided we get rid of our past obligations. And the judge says, well, what do you mean by that? And the answer is, well, look, we need to get rid of our pension uh, obligations. We need to get rid of our health care obligations. So, in effect, the, the company will renege upon its uh, health care and, uh, uh, and, and pension obligations. A and suddenly people find themselves, they've lost their pension rights, and they don't have their pension anymore. Now, in the United States, uh, there is a pension insurance fund which will say, well, if United Airlines gives up its pension system and American Airlines gives it up, uh, then the state will pick it up. But the state usually picks it up not according to uh, the value that uh, people were expected. So somebody from, who working for American Airlines might uh, expect to get $80,000 a year in the way of pensions, but uh, the pension fund only pays $40,000 a year, which is very, very difficult to... Uh, uh, to, to live on for, 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 for many people. So uh, the, the, the loss of, uh, of pension rights becomes a very important mode of, uh, of accumulation. Now, uh, this is what happened to many people in Greece. If you were, if you were uh, in the public sector and you retired, I have a colleague who retired there uh, three years ago, and only last month did he get a first payment of his pension. So he spent three years without any payment whatsoever from the state pension because the state pension was not funded. Uh, and, and actually, there's a lot of big problem over pension rights all, all around the world where actually ca big capital is accumulating in some ways on the basis of not paying uh, for, the, for the pension uh, pension rights. Now, all of these forms of accumulation uh, are with us right now. And they're not the same as, as, uh, as those which existed when Marx was talking about the origins of capital. Uh, they're not like that at all. Uh, they are actually value that is already being created under capital is being redistributed. Uh, 
and it's being redistributed, of course, from uh, the mass of the population uh, to increasing centralization and creation of uh, huge asset wealth uh, within the top one or ten, uh, you know, ten percent of the population. So, uh, accumulation by dispossession then uh, is, uh, in fact, uh, something that we need to take very seriously as in, in being a, 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 a one, of the, one of the mechanisms by which uh, capital is currently being reproduced. And one of the arguments I would make, uh, however, is that uh, accumulation by dispossession has always been there, has always been significant. It's never gone away that since Marx was writing about the 17th and 18th century capital and the origins there, that actually uh, it, it never stopped. It's always been there. But that since the 1970s in particular, we've had more and more accumulation shifting towards the question of dispossession rather than the creation of value through the employment of labor and production. And this then uh, raises a kind of interesting kind of questions as to the nature of the capitalist society in which we currently exist. To what degree do we have to organize struggle against accumulation by dispossession? And of course, you will find anti-gentrification struggles. You will find struggles against uh, the loss of pensions and the loss of uh, health care rights and the loss of, uh, of, of that, losses of that sort. We'll find struggles against land grabbing. Uh, but uh, in exactly the same way that Marx talked about uh, in the 17th and 18th century, how state power frequently is mobilized by the affluent classes to dispossess the rest of the population. So we see many forms of dispossession going on in, in, at this time. If you look, for example, at the last uh, 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 sort of reform of the tax code and tax law in this country, uh, what you'll see is a redistribution of wealth and power uh, and a dispossession of certain kinds of forms of rights at the same time as there are flows being uh, of, of value being uh, channeled more and more to the corporations and more and more to uh, the uh, to the affluent classes so there are many techniques of uh, dispossession and it seems to me that it'd be very important to write as it were uh, a sort of text on on the dis uh, on accumulation by dispossession in the current uh, situation and the various mechanisms that uh, uh, th that exist for that uh, dis dispossession to uh, to occur, and I, I think that uh, also it's a moment when, uh, as it were, the original sin uh, that came with the origins of capitalism—that uh, this whole thing was built upon uh, violence, lies, fraud, cheating, and the like. And if you look at what happened in housing markets in this country in 2007, 2008, how much of it was based upon dispossessions of populations illegally, uh, but through violence, fraud, and, and, uh, uh, and, and of course, uh, the, the, the promulgation of, of a certain kind of uh, story of conspiracy and, 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 and the lies, which we now, now uh, are actually confronted with, uh, from the standpoint of uh, the way political power works. So accumulation by dispossession then is a terribly important uh, aspect of our current society. It actually is generating a great deal in the way of protests and a great deal in the way of growth uh, is now being channeled in that direction rather than uh, towards the, the more classic means of, of, uh, of appropriation. And we see actually merchant capital re-emerging as a major uh, mechanism for the appropriation of wealth. So if you take a, a company like Google, well, it, it's partly involved in, of course, the design of uh, new uh, 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 vehicles for, for, for production. But a lot of what Google is about is also appropriation in the market. It's a merchant capitalist operation. And so Google has become hugely important and, and Apple has become uh, hugely important through merchant capitalist practices of, of appropriation uh, in, in the market rather than uh, the organization of uh, 
productive capacity at the point of, uh, of production. So that industrial capitalism has, in, in a way, you know, given way increasingly to merchant capitalism, rentier capitalism, and the mechanisms by which rentier capitalism and merchant capitalism works are more and more about appropriation and accumulation by dispossession than they are about through the organization of production and the exploitation of living labor in production. So this is the kind of capitalist society we've moved towards. It's the one which is kind of uh, uh, not going to be uh, tamed, as it were, uh, by classical uh, techniques of uh, left organizing. It has to be tamed by a completely different uh, political apparatus and political forms of political protest. And I think those forms of political protest uh, have to be uh, targeted in a, in, a, in a very, very different uh, way than is currently the case. Uh, so let me end, if you like, with one of the fantasies I have about uh, the end of, uh, of, of capital accumulation through class struggle. And it goes like this, that actually... Uh, the, the nodal points uh, within contemporary capitalism are very much the, 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 the nodal points of logistics. Uh, and I have a fantasy that would say, uh, if we organized all the airport workers in the world, and all the airport workers in the world suddenly decided not to show up to work one day, then capitalism would be stopped. It would be stopped dead in its tracks. There is a tremendous power which exists which is that if the airports are no longer working, uh, the system comes to an end. And we've seen some evidence of that. Uh, for instance, the, uh, the, the, the shutdown of the federal government, which occurred in this country uh, earlier in 2019, suddenly came to an end. And it came to an end a day after three airports uh, in the United States found they could not deal uh, any longer with uh, the stress of working without uh, any kind of pay. And suddenly I think uh, there was a recognition that if all of the airports in the United States suddenly shut down, then uh, that would be a terrible thing. And, and it was interesting, the, 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 the government shutdown ended within 24 hours of three airports basically half shutting down because they could no longer uh, operate without, uh, without, without the federal workers doing the jobs they were supposed to do. So there's the power, if you like, and some of that power can also be orchestrated around questions of rights to health care, rights to pensions, right, rights to social security, uh, all of those questions which need to be kind of addressed, uh, and, but they need those, those questions have to be backed by sufficient power within the system to be able to confront an economy which is based on accumulation by dispossession as much as it's based upon uh, the exploitation of living labor in production. Thank you for joining me today. You've been listening to David Harvey's Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a Democracy at Work production. A special thank you to the wonderful Patreon community for supporting this project.